state at the local level is going to depend upon how that money recirculates in the local economy that could be within the county or it could be within the, within the uh, highway district. All right, and so then what I'm going to give you then uh, finally are just the impacts where we've aggregated it up into the different districts. Right, the largest amount of expenditures actually occurred in Thomaston, this district where we're making it. Uh, secondly, in Tennell, and then thirdly, in Shambly. Uh, on average, when I say the largest amount, that was about $600 million. But no district received less than $450 million. So there was pretty fairly, fairly, fairly All right, employment impacts. All right, so. This is the total number of jobs that were created in the various districts, and this is the multiplier for the district. Remember I told you that in Chambly, right, which encompasses many of the counties that make up metropolitan Atlanta, right, you had, right, you had 6,600 jobs created. You have the largest, the smallest employment multiplier per number of jobs created, and that's because people within the metro area are spending a larger percentage of their money on products produced outside of the metro area, right? If you're doing imports and, you know, fancy automobiles and all that kind of stuff. All right, but that's, that's what happens. So as a result, per dollar spent, you get a smaller employment impact. The largest impact occurred in, in Thomaston, right? And they also have the, the largest uh, employment multiplier. All right, if you look at household income, right, um, here you find that the largest amount of household income was generated in Shambly. And that's because, again, the pattern of industries within the economy, within the, the, the uh, district itself, meaning that most of the prime contractors that executed projects were here, a larger share of money that went to, uh, the, within the supply chain went to suppliers within um, the, uh, within District 7. So household income multiplier, therefore, is larger, much larger, than it is for other areas. Now, if you were to drill down to the county level, you'll find variations that also look just like that. Right? They're going to vary depending upon the pattern of industry and its industry. The total economic impact, the total economic impact, while it, it was largest, of course, in Thomaston, the largest multiplier occurred in in the, uh, District 7, although it had the smallest employment multiplier, right, that's just one aspect of it. You also have the household income multiplier, and you have income generated in the supply chain and what have you. When you add all that together, you get overall the largest impact per dollar spent occurs in District 7, that was $880 million for a large per year, um, but per dollar spent, it was huge. The absolute largest amount occurred there. And then, this kind of helps you see the, the, the influence of sort of the characteristics of supply chains, all right? And so supply chains, think about, for example, if you're going to execute a highway project somewhere, there are a lot of backwards and forwards linkages, meaning that you've got to have, you got to have dirt, you've got to have, you know, there's a trucking and hauling, there's paving, there's striping, there's all kinds of stuff. There's grassing, there's grading, you know, uh, and everything that comes. And so the question becomes, where are those projects procured from? In what geographic area are those products and services procured from? So the extent to which they are procured within the local area, you're going to have a larger revenue going to small businesses per dollar spent. Right? And so within District 7, we get revenue per dollar spent of about 21 cents, and then smaller in other areas. All right, so what do we conclude? Economic Benefits differ a great deal across local areas. That is, by total output, employment, household income, and small business revenue, there are a lot of differences. And so these differences are missed when we simply say, okay, what's the total economic impact, right? Well, the economic impact, yeah, you got the right number in terms of total, but if you want to talk about economic development, particularly local, local area economic development, you can't assume that that total impact multiply is going to apply, going to apply to that local area. All right, state DOTs, while they cannot alter spending patterns, in other words, they can't, problems of transportation can't go in and tell people how to spend their money. So that's not a lever of policy that they can influence. 
So what we have to do then is look at one of the other levers if you want to optimize the amount of impact on economic development. So to maximize local economic development impacts, DOT procurement policies must optimize local business engagement. That's the most important factor. For example, when we analyze the, the expenditures, both the prime contractors and supply, suppliers, uh, uh, subcontractors, we found that 86% of the $3.1 billion expenditures that was, was awarded to prime contractors that, are lo that were located within the state of Georgia, meaning 14% went out. That's a leakage, right? When we looked at subcontractors, we found that 89% went to subcontractors that were located within the state, and 11% went out. Well, that's an area in which, from the standpoint of procurement policies, uh, an agency can exercise some leverage over. Uh, but particularly, it's a, uh, one of the things that they can do, one of the things that Georgia Department of Transportation has done, and all departments of transportation, state departments, have been mandated to do is establish small business programs. Right? And those small business programs, particularly, depending upon where and how they're established, can help maximize the amount of revenue that goes to uh, businesses in, in local areas. Uh, what we found is that most of the, uh, uh, there was a heavy concentration of prime contractors in one particular location, as you might suspect, in District 7, right? While on the other hand, the subcontractors were fairly evenly spread out across the state. And so it, what it means is that there is significant opportunity to maximize local development by building the capacity of local suppliers, because generally speaking, they're more geographically dispersed, and so they're already there. And the extent to which you can get them involved in the supply chain, delivering highway projects, means the extent to which you increase economic impact. And so, small business and other procurement policies matter when it comes to economic development. That's the sort of nuts and bolts of this thing. I'll take any questions. We've separated out in, in the study. We have money that actually goes federal money, and we have state money. We have, uh, for example, as I mentioned, the federal fiscal dollars that came into the state. There was some 600 million of those dollars. That was new dollars that came into the state. 
thing. So we looked at that. Um, we, we looked at the money that, for example, that flowed through the Department of Transportation down to the county jurisdictions. So we looked at that. So yeah, we, in other words, to answer your question, yeah, we separate all of those. So multiply like 1.6, mm -hmm. is that to multiply around So that, all right, so it doesn't matter whether, only, the only thing that matters is whether the money is new money, all right, now. In terms of what the size of the multiplier is, what determines that is the industry that it's spent in. So that whether it, if it's new money, it's new state money, new local money, or new federal money, if it's spent in bridge construction, it's going to have the same multiplier. And so what we did within this project is that we uh, we mapped every industry within which uh, highway projects were awarded, and then mapped them into the M plan model that gave us development. Next speaker is Sarah Smith from Georgia Tech. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, Sarah Smith. I'm a research scientist here at the Center for Quality Growth and Regional Development at Georgia Tech, and we're in the College of Architecture. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you today a little bit about um, our ongoing mega, region, mega regions uh, research initiative that we have at the center. Um, a recent peer exchange that we conducted uh, here in Atlanta last fall and uh, on that topic, and then some of the conclusions that came out of that peer exchange, as well as what we think are the next steps as a result of, uh, of that peer exchange. So our, uh, our Mega Regions Research Initiative at the center has been going on for almost a decade, and has been led by Dr. Catherine Ross, our center director, um, and you can see this is our definition here that as we think about mega regions and how we frame the idea of planning at the mega regional scale. And mega regions essentially are is the is the understanding and, and the addressing of um, issues that span across beyond cities, beyond regions, and beyond states. So that would particularly include um, economic issues, economic ties, infrastructure planning, uh, and environmental issues such as water, air quality. Um, so we really feel that, that the only way to properly and effectively address those issues is at this, global, at this larger scale, and even it's a global scale beyond just the United States and beyond um, 
our adjacent neighbors. So we have had a long-standing relationship with FHWA on this topic and have assisted FHWA to develop a website. Um, this is a great repository of uh, research, current research on mega regions, and um, it's a good uh, portal for you to learn more about the topic. So this is a map that we've developed at the center, um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Ross, um, to look at, uh, basically identify the 10 U.S. mega regions as we see them. And this is a really good illustration because it's the night lights and we don't actually think of mega regions in terms of, we have sort of a permeable boundary and a permeable definition of mega regions, so depending on the issue that we're attempting to address. And that's reflected here. And I want to also draw your attention, of course, to the Piedmont Atlantic mega region, which is where we're located here in Atlanta. Um, so this topic, as I mentioned, is of great interest to Federal Highways and USDOT, and they're great partners of ours. Um, and there's, to that end, there's a, there's a peer exchange program that's funded by FHWA and uh, Federal Transit administ Administration. Uh, and, and so mega regions has been a topic of the peer exchange program since 2012, was the, was the first mega regions um, peer exchange that was held in Arizona. And so Federal Highways encouraged us to think about hosting a, uh, a mega regions peer exchange focused um, event here in Atlanta. And so we, we did that and, um, and we wanted to focus on transportation planning specifically and economic ties and connections specifically as well. And especially around the areas of freight flow and freight movement. So certainly the reason for that was because of the, the hub, the logistics hub that's represented by Atlanta here in the state and certainly the uh, Port of Savannah which is of course, located on the Georgia coast, and is the fourth busiest um, port in the nation. So we were able to um, have great support and, and a partnership with the Atlanta Regional Commission um, here in our state, and ARC actually functioned as the, the host agency for the peer exchange. And a huge emphasis as well, and, and really what was very innovative about this peer exchange was that we brought, for, we brought um, the private sector into, into our planning process. And um, we were able to do this with the help of the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. And the Metro Chamber was an incredible partner for us through the peer exchange planning process. Uh, and, they, and they were able to not only um, draw on their repository of connections to, for speakers as well as audience participants um, to share, their, share the insight from the private sector in terms of what was needed from the transportation, and uh, what was needed for transportation planning and freight flow um, needs from the perspective of private, private industry. So, in terms of our, um, the emerging trends that we found as a result of the peer exchange, um, I first wanted to share um, this map and kind of, I, this was really our first, um, the first point that came out in our very first session of the peer exchange, which was the issue of our um, lack of capacity on our freight network. Um, and that if we continue on our current trajectory, not only are we not going to make, not only are we not going to get better, we're not even going to maintain our level of congestion as it currently stands. So that was really a huge issue and kind of a common theme throughout our entire peer exchange. Um, and so clearly that was, that's an issue across statewide, across our mega regions planning. It's a huge issue for our private partners. And, um, and then I just also did want to highlight what our state um, GDOT, Georgia DOT, which is a very strong, close partner of ours here at Georgia Tech, um, has, actually, has actually taken an, an innovative um, approach already in, de in developing the Georgia Statewide Freight and Logistics Plan. So GDOT has, um, has begun to really define what are the primary corridors 
in terms of freight movement, the critical corridors for our state, um, and especially with regards to what it means for us to have such a major um, node in terms of the Port of Savannah for imports and exports for the state and what that means for our infrastructure here. And GDOT was also one of our speakers at the peer exchange and highlighted the work that we've done we've done here in the state on the um, freight logistics plan. And just to um, highlight another major trend which you can see illustrated here in terms of the advisory committee that GDOT developed for the statewide plan. Um, clearly you can see that the need to integrate the, the perspectives and um, the ideas of the private sector were, were a part of the development of this plan. So who all do we have at our, at, for our attendees? Um, we were very fortunate to have not only GDOT and our, our other state DOTs, Represented, we had our federal partners represented. We had the uh, the Port Authority. We had Hartsfield Jackson. We had, um, and then we had Home Depot. We had Genuine Parts, Norfolk Southern, among others, from the private sector um, as a result of our partners at the Metro Chamber. So, what were some of the major um, other major themes that emerged from the peer exchange? I think this is a great picture that was that uh, was provided to us by the San Diego um, Association of Governments. And in terms of thinking about issues that are mega regional, that are global in scope, when you're dealing with a border crossing, such as this one, which is um, crossing into Mexico, um, and the innovative programs that they've developed in order to, de to deal with this major bottleneck that we have um, for freight to flow into this country. And as you can clearly see in this photograph, the uh, cost of congestion here is very high, and wait times at this border crossing can be several hours. Um, and then just some of the key takeaways from our Home Depot presentation. Um, again, looking at, thinking about close coordination with what are, what are the needs of the private sector, what are the customer essentially needs in terms of infrastructure um, improvement and and thinking through future investments and re effective and efficient return on investment. So uh, a major theme that emerged was the idea of reliability and consistency. So we did hear that across our um, private sector partners in terms of planning for the arrival of a shipment is very critical since the labor and personnel needs are, are in place and that's almost more critical than, than the shipment arriving quickly is for it to arrive when it's scheduled to arrive. So that was a major theme that we heard throughout. And you can see certainly here in terms of the different modes and how the costs break down across uh, Home Depot's business model um, that is truly multimodal. And then if we think about if we think about our corridors, well, another key point is that not, cor not all corridors are necessarily created equal. So Home Depot provided with this map, among many others, which shows some of their distribution and deployment centers. Um, and then I think this is a great example because when we think about this, this kind of map and this kind of data and these point locations, and then we compare it to our, for example, the map that, that uh, USDOT released last October of the primary freight network. It's just, this peer exchange was an excellent opportunity to think about, yes, you can see that clearly these line up fairly well, and we would certainly hope that when we're developing our planning tools that we're thinking about and we're aware of those needs, but, but are we? And do we have really an effective method to, to really share where are those distribution centers, not just for Home Depot, but across a variety of industries, are we really effectively thinking through what the needs are? And certainly that's exactly what we were, the relationship and the sharing of perspectives that we were brokering through our peer exchange. Um, then a few kind of key takeaways, this is uh, from Genuine Parts, um, and just thinking about, uh, first of all, they have 
increasingly shifted their operations to rail as rail has become more reliable. So once again, the theme of reliability is uh, the mo of the most importance to the business model. Um, and then also in terms of thinking about spatial data, he gave us some thresholds in terms of 700 miles as approximate cost effective um, breaking point for intermodal shipments. So, and just thinking about our transportation planning decisions that we're making, if we know some of these thresholds and benchmarks and we're clearly and truly informed by um, having these close relationships with our partners in the private sector, then we can effectively plan for um, their needs. So, um, so then the interesting, another interesting uh, idea that emerged was that the private sector has already been essentially planning at the mega region scale. So in a way, we're somewhat catching up, um, and we do have a model that we can we can utilize in order to think about how commodities flow across uh, a global scale, and um, and that we can use this as a model. Um, certainly stakeholder input is necessary and um, is, was reflected in terms of our, the people that we were fortunate enough to have at the table and the kind of information that was able to be shared among the different entities. Um, another critical theme that emerged was the issue of data and um, Frank Southworth touched on this a little bit in his presentation as well. But what we heard again and again from all of our presenters was that um, they were utilizing basically a variety of data um, sources cobbled together, different scales. Some of it was purchased, some of it is public, publicly accessible. And, um, and then some MPOs, for example, uh, smaller ones don't have the resources to purchase the kind of economic data that is required for effective planning. So um, what we're recommending as a result of the peer exchange and what we were encouraging our federal partners to consider is a public data, publicly available data repository um, where this kind of spatial data could easily be, be accessed by uh, across a variety of um, jurisdictions. So in, in conclusion, um, so the challenges of capacity and, cr and increasing congestion are certainly not going away and are going to continue to be an issue um, unless we proactively uh, make some changes. The new and ever-changing dynamics, um, another issue that, we, that came up again and again was the differing sort of temporal scales that we deal with between the public sector and the private sector where our private sector partners are working on a monthly or maybe a quarterly kind of time frame, a lot of our work in the public sector is much more long term. So how do we kind of reconcile those, um, those different timelines to effectively plan and make decisions? Um, again, multiple stakeholders are required to integrate both the public and private sector needs and effectively address them. And we need to continue to build on these case studies that we've begun to establish and really understand the intricacies and the, and the data um, that's available and share it um, across, across the public sector and private sector in, uh, in order to effectively plan. And our, um, all of our sessions are actually available online as well and uh, on this YouTube <coughs> website, so please Take a moment to jot this down and you can view all of them yourself uh, to get a first-hand first -hand view of what we were able to accomplish at this, at this peer exchange. And we also have a report that's available on the Federal Highways uh, website for the details of the conclusions. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Yeah, I think this is out of curiosity. Is it based on study now? Is it any? Because it's 
respect to the uh, mm -hmm. focus of the foreign police, uh, is there any analysis showing that uh, the safety foreign police, what are the infrastructural problems is going to be required for great institutions to support free logistics and how much is the So kind of prioritize those corridors there is a known and known good idea that some of the corridors well, yeah, so you're exactly right. So this is, it was actually generated in 2007. And um, that primary freight network map that I showed as well, that is the most current. That just came out in last October. So exactly to your point, um, those that kind of data needs to be overlaid and not all of those corridors necessarily have the, the greatest potential for the greatest impact and the greatest return on investment. And we need to have a better understanding between, you know, where are those industrial clusters located, where are the best, you know, opportunities for transferring, intermodal transfers, um, where does the rail network overlay, and where, how can we kind of prioritize among these areas for the maximum? Because certainly we can't um, make all the, in any way, make all the capacity adjustments necessary. I think I see from one point, for example, from the, from the industry, certainly, I think it's used to get a real data and get a fleet. Uh, probably the UPS, probably they are also just the, the <coughs> So from your data, I may not show and say, well, so much traffic or so much congestion. That is because my team, I was forced to change the route because I know here it's not good. So from the other label and other analysis, do you focus, say, 2040 or 2015, that based on actually the need from point A to point B, not necessarily just based on current infrastructure. What other additional infrastructure is needed? I'm just curious, is there any kind of that kind of stuff that you've done? Yeah. One of the things that we've done, which we'll be reporting on shortly, is we've actually um, have um, next few truck data um, that has a GPS um, technology on it. Uh, and it's actually tracking not just what this says, but where trucks really are going. Uh, and so a part of looking at what the, the diversion looks like is, is where that diverting to which quarters now, whether they're uh, second because of congestion or a number of other uh, factors, are ones we need to consider. So we are actively in the midst of two studies that are using that kind of data information. And I, I kind of have a comment, it's not so much a question that I would share with the group. Uh, we spent two great days, and it was lovely to have the private sector in the room, which usually we talk to each other. So I thought it was refreshing to have their input for one thing really struck me, uh, Mike Moore, who was, I guess, a CEO or very high up in the genuine parts, said, when you pull into their store, pull in, you want to get a gas, uh, oil change, they don't even order the part until you walk in. They order it, get it there, and get you out in 30 minutes. That's a supply chain. You tell me how we accommodate that is what we do now. I think we don't. And it's a challenge, and it's constantly changing. So I think the demands uh, in terms of meeting the needs of the private sector are changing as we speak what they ever have before. And we spent some time with our colleagues from ISYE uh, last week. They just come back from the Panama Canal looking at the money that China's going to put into the Suez Canal. It's like $25 billion, some huge number. And again, all of that changes, I think, the expectations about how we provide uh, the so supporting infrastructure, particularly as we sort of squeeze our, our DLT capacity down to the standstill not funding adequate staff, uh, not putting enough money on the table for all the kinds of, of improvements that we know we have to make to stay competitive. So just a few observations that at least were enlightening for me. I guess you brought up because you the subject up on the, the, this study for the truck volume estimated for 2040, are you looking into the, the, the impact that how the expansion of the management canal is going to have? Uh, it may darken this map so much more, or it may actually, in 
of that dark light and some portions of Florida and dark in some portions of North, depending on you know how those mega tankers are going to be actually routing themselves. Were there any studies that you looked at or? So this, this next study will answer that question, I guess. Thank you. All right, our next speaker, uh, David Lee from Georgia Tech. Thank you very much. Uh, we have lots of good uh, session here. Uh, I will economics and uh, freight, and probably uh, we just uh, uh, discussed about uh, what kind of uh, corridor is important to do that, probably we need to develop a, a, a simulation tool that's why uh, there is important to develop uh, this kind of model uh, as a tool. Uh, my name is David Lee, and I'm working at the Center for Quality Growth and Regional Development of Georgia Tech. And uh, um, our collaboration, uh, this, this the project has, has been uh, uh, funded by uh, uh, partially uh, Georgia DOT also, and uh, having collaboration with uh, Dr. Frank Southworth and UAB and Atlanta Regional Commission and Regional Planning Commission uh, of uh, Great uh, Birmingham. Uh, so we have lots of collaborators. And uh, state and regional transportation planning agencies are increasingly uh, recognizing uh, the need for policies and programs addressing freight issues to ensure on efficient and reliable freight transportation system. A uh, major challenge, however, remains the lack of available freight data, as we talked about a lot here, um, to ensure informed decision. So this uh, project is about uh, uh, freight demand modeling at uh, metropolitan uh, level, regional level. And GPS data has not been uh, used ex extensively as an input for freight model. Uh, but it has a lot of potential. So uh, through this project, we are developing two uh, uh, prototype models uh, for different uh, areas, one for uh, uh, Atlanta region, and uh, the other one is for Birmingham uh, uh, region in Alabama. And exploring a robust means for incorporating GPS model inputs into uh, original truck models. Uh, MPOs and uh, DOTs around the country may benefit from uh, the methodology we are using here. Uh, here is a, a research overview. Uh, this, the result of this research will inform and examine data sharing and modeling and collaborative planning and integration of MPO freight activity in statewide planning, uh, freight planning. So DOTs and MPOs need a standardized kind of uh, freight demand model, uh, which is uh, reliable, accurate, and approachable. Um, there are some problems related to MPO or uh, truck demand model. Uh, freight movements uh, have been largely neglected in travel demand models. And models in practice are very uh, not not uh, very sophisticated, and problems are more significant when you are uh, going into the small and uh, medium sized uh, MPO level because the data is not available. And uh, when you develop this kind of model, you need a kind of survey uh, to gather data. And truck surveys are very expensive and uh, do not provide sufficient data. Uh, so models missing freight components uh, could uh, overestimate capacity. So if you don't have those tools, the incapability to provide adequate info to decision makers could give wrong direction when they make a, a important decision making. And 
we did the literature review uh, on type of freight uh, models uh, in practice and also documented the challenges and the significant uh, challenges, uh, one of the significant challenges was uh, the limited data availability. And we also did the uh, DOT and MPO survey on uh, freight modeling activity um, and the uh, main fi findings are uh, freight model are still relatively rare in both uh, DOTs and MPOs. And most models are uh, uh, vehicle based. We know the commodity base is very important but it's uh, we are not uh, getting there yet. Also, GPS data uh, remains rare. So, lack of data remains the lar largest obstacle to freight models. That was our finding of our survey. And uh, through this project, uh, we developed a protocol of a tour based truck model. <coughs> Here is a conceptual framework and uh, uh, key components for a tour-based truck model developed. Starting with the tour generation and going through a uh, tour main destination choice, and intermediate stop model, also stop location model, time of day, trip uh, accumulator, and trip assignment. Uh, each step involves uh, lots of uh, logic models and sequence of uh, procedures. Four months worth of GPS pings uh, from a sample of trucks in and around the Atlanta area, also Birmingham area, uh, for uh, February, May, July, and October 2011. Uh, two, two weeks for each sample uh, and it is gather, gathering the time and date and location of the information of the truck movement. So these records are stored on the device on board the truck and uh, later downloaded and uh, gathered uh, uh, through the provider, data provider, uh, which we gathered, uh, which provided the data to us uh, Example, at tree. This picture shows those uh, GPS locations uh, around the Atlanta region, and uh, we have a tremendous uh, data record and total 14 million record, and uh, it covers eight weeks uh, for 5,000 different trucks in uh, 2011. It uh, covers a 20 county area, which is the same uh, area for the uh, ARC's travel demand model. And uh, 2000, over 2,000 uh, uh, travel demand, uh, the TAZ zones and uh, 91 external uh, stations. Uh, this one is for Birmingham area. Uh, it's a little bit less than the Atlanta ones, and but still it's a 4.5 million records. In covering uh, two county area, aligning with the Birmingham area MPO's traveling man model. Uh, these are a list of attributes uh, obtained for truck record. So you see the each individual truck. ID and then uh, specific date from origin and uh, uh, time frame for uh, destination and you see the, uh, the speed and uh, uh, distance travel also. So when after you receive all those uh, GPS uh, truck record, we went through uh, uh, so series of processing to uh, delete unnecessary record. Uh, there are lots of uh, inconsistent data also, so we eliminate some uh, record, for example, the weekends and holidays uh, and uh, improper geocoding and uh, come up with some uh, definition uh, on uh, the definition of the stop and movement in motion and coming to stop, things like that. And we converted those 
drug record to the true uh, treatment record first, and then also we converted the treat record uh, to tours, uh, defining uh, uh, tours by these definitions. So starting with the uh, 12 or 14 million uh, trouble record, we came down 700,000 trips and uh, 220,000 uh, tours. So here's the example of each, the circle represent a, a, a single uh, TAZ, turtle analysis zone, and uh, we uh, uh, picked one trop, a unique ID here, and, and uh, looking at one day, uh, February 16th of uh, 2011. And tour one starting from zone 401 and taking the multi uh, stop in intermediate stops and then uh, trip end, ends at the zone uh, 1440. That was a tour one. And uh, the next day, uh, February uh, 17th, uh, the tour start from the zone uh, 1440 and then taking the intermediate. Uh, stops and then end at uh, zone 410. Uh, by our definition, tour three start from the zone uh, 143 and taking also the intermediate stop and ending at zone 143. So you look at those the three days of uh, February uh, 2011 for a single specific truck, uh, now you have uh, 224 cleaned truck record, which was uh, actually more provided, but after you cleaned out the, the record it down to uh, 224, and uh, it makes 23 trips, but uh, end up with uh, three tours. So using uh, those uh, tour record, we uh, came came out the the actual model developed, and uh, this is the the validation part of uh, observed and estimated link level volume and the uh, horizontal represent the estimated uh, link volume, and the vertical is observed. Count uh, those link, link volume. Object link volume is based on uh, automatic uh, traffic recorder. So we have those information along the uh, specific link, and we compare the those selected uh, link volume uh, versus the model estimated. And as you see, the counted links generally straddle the diagonal line that indicates the perfect fit and the model result aligns very closely with the truck counts that uh, have been observed. And what kind of obstacle and challenges we are facing here uh, using uh, GPS data? GPS data has a lot of inconsistencies, so uh, you have to come up with some solution how to handle those kind of inconsistency. Also, the GPS uh, sampling is not giving you much information except the location info. And uh, the XY coordinate info could have been uh, provided, but actually we didn't have that. Uh, instead, we had uh, uh, the data has been converted to TAZ level. So uh, we don't know exact XY coordinate uh, but uh, we converted it into the TAZ level, so it's, it's kind of a little bit uh, uh, aggregate level, but it was uh, a, uh, we were able to develop uh, our model based on those uh, provided data. And also, uh, not much description about the truck and operator. Uh, we don't know whether the truck is empty or what kind of commodity is uh, filled in a specific truck uh, that is very important when you develop the commodity based model. So that's kind of a limitation of the data, but uh, uh, to get to uh, 
the commodity-based model, still uh, we are treat uh, vehicle-based treat uh, based model uh, uh, with the contribution of the GPS uh, inside. An external station geocoding was not um, very much accurate. It was also kind of obstacle. This graph shows. Uh, Uh, link volume comparison. Current ALC model is a good example of aggregate four-step process from trip generation, trip distribution, time of day, and uh, trip assignment, and uh, stratified by uh, medium and heavy truck, and calibrated to 2,000 count data, truck count data, and then updated to 2,005 counts. So. Uh, to compare those two different models, one, one current ALC model versus two uh, newly developed tour-based model, uh, we got the number uh, for 2010 for both models. So 2010 from ALC model was is kind of projection, right? Model uh, a forecast for the future year based on the 2000 base year. But our model is 2010 uh, as a base year. That's a difference and uh, validated the two uh, 2010 um, truck uh, count. So uh, you, you see uh, it's not really, uh, you cannot really compare those two different models, but uh, you can see what uh, those different models produce as an output in terms of a truck uh, 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 estimation at the link level for the entire network. So covering uh, uh, 54,000 links, and each dot you can see for AM and PM, the ARC, current ARC model uh, overestimate uh, than the tour-based model. And it's the same for midday. But interestingly, you see the the right hand side, uh, nighttime, the ARC model uh, underestimates uh, truck volume for the entire network. So what I'm saying here is if we use, maybe maybe I don't know exactly the reason why it overestimates for a particular time of day or underestimates a particular time of day, but you can see uh, the funding allocation, uh, government expenditure will go through based on this kind of uh, uh, model simulation output, right? So, for if uh, to develop a more accurate uh, model is very important because without having those tools, the funding will go different way. So that's uh, what I'm arguing here. Developing the true based model may not be the ideal. Uh, maybe we need to wait until we get some kind of commodity-based uh, commodity model, but we cannot wait uh, until when. So we do whatever uh, best we can do at this point, which it is uh, we are suggesting maybe we can use this uh, tour-based model instead of the current uh, trip-based visual model to do you know, the job uh, more accurately. And as a kind of conclusion, I cannot really conclude the things here, but uh, some findings and suggestions in the future research. So GPS data can create robust tour-based freight, uh, freight models. Uh, also, it requires extensive processing to be useful. And um, tour-based structure reflects uh, truck travel more accurately. Also, it, it is um, uh, more sophisticated data or richness of the future or potential data should be provided in order to get the uh, things done. And future research needs, first, uh, future research should obtain GPS data that uh, distinguishes different type of trucks, stratification of the truck classification, uh, to permit more precise modeling uh, uh, based on truck characteristics. And also, researchers should also work with the practitioners, modelers, and planners 
at, uh, government agencies to complement trial-based drop models with the GPS data in different settings to overcome local and regional differences. But finally, uh, researchers should examine the range of applications uh, that improve the truck modeling can have, including impact on air quality models, uh, traffic congestion forecasts, and investment decisions. Uh, that ends my presentation. If you have any question, I can probably answer if I can. I'm wondering, is, has there been any attempt to use, and this is in reference to like the, the commodities that trucks are carrying, any um, attempt to look at, say, point of origin as an instrumental sort of variable to impute truck cargo on, say, for example, you know, original equipment manufacturers and automobiles, you know, trucks originating from sort of an auto factory, you know, we pretty much know what would be there. Or UPS, parts of course, something like that. Is there any attempt to look at that? At least while you wouldn't be able to do it on a you know a large scale, at least you might be able to make some some sort of statistical inferences that you can shoot to a broader range of the track. Uh, I think uh, if I understand correctly, you are asking the possibility of combining this kind of the modeling tool to uh, uh, economic indicator to uh, measure the economic uh, performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, okay. well, I'm looking at, for example, you're indicating that in your models, you don't know why you can, you can model trucks, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, traffic patterns, you don't know what the cargo is. So I'm wondering if it is a possibility of using the origin of trucks to make some imputation about what the cargo might be, and then you could sort of statistically validate it, you know, one way or another, you know, based on some sample. But is there, I mean, is that possible? I don't know the area. I'm just asking, is it possible to do that, to gain information about cargo? Uh, I'm, I don't have expertise in cargo, so <laughs> <laughs> I should know more about cargo and then probably uh, develop uh, some uh, possibilities from yeah. there. But I, th I think, uh, uh, intuitively, I think it, it, it should be. I, I think that's a really important question, and this whole idea of us becoming smarter about cargo. Because then maybe some truck trips become rail trips, and vice versa. But unless we know what those opportunities set are, I think we're not uh, utilizing our investments as much as we might. But the other thing we're thinking about doing much, but we're glad we're here, which is your work is taking the implant data and drilling that down to the county level so we can paint county economic pictures relative to what's happening based on what those uh, industries are. Uh, and just as a way of being able to, to sort of link sort of uh, uh, what's happening relative to the freight network and what's happening relative to where it goes, who impacts it, where, which county. Um, so we are going to uh, take the implant model and tie some of that down to the work that we're doing now with the GPS. And then you could probably even go into that 140 section table because it talks about linkages. And it has commodity linkages, right? And it has financial linkages, but you could actually look at the commodity linkage table and maybe sort of map or make some inferences about commodities. Truck car. Yeah, it has commodities. It doesn't really have commodity linkages. It has industry to industry. That's right. And you can get down the input output modeling. Really, it's using make tables that are interested in who uses what and who makes what. But you can't get down. You've got a 15 by 15, a 69 by 69, a 103 by 103, and none of them are really commodity makers. They're all industry to industry makers. And then the commodity data we have, like the fact, which produced those. Is very difficult. So the crosswalk between the industry and commodity is very iffy. I know because I don't that a lot of people use, and it's very iffy indeed. So what we need to do is, is do what was suggested earlier is go out and talk to the kids and the, and the, the you know, UPSs and people and figure out what the heck's going on. Can we get the big stuff around? Because we can't get the 
provide the answers that the judge and DOT and part of the DOT want. So the statistical accuracy for telling you what size of truck it is is not as great as the statistical accuracy for telling you what's it going to cost you if you don't know the car. It sounds like we are all complaining about the availability <laughs> in terms of the commodity level, right? So I think, uh, but the money is an issue. So federal government knows the issue, but uh, how, you know, Fab 3 is uh, fabulous and uh, we, we, we really need to desegregate the level. Uh, maybe maybe uh, smaller than the county level. We cannot really purchase the transfer as an alternative data for entire countries for the research purposes or the agency cannot you know, for those kind of data. So, I mean, I'm just showing the possibility what can GPS, the current available GPS data can contribute to this kind of field. So. See, fact three, that traffic assignment is based upon 48,000 locations. Uh, 48,000. But it's breaking down bit by bit by bit, so it's really a model. So that's 40% of these data, uh, as data. So even the commodity flow data that we have is about 40% model. So, you know, if we have to admit to ourselves that we really need to get out there and make the economic activity data to the great data. I mean, I think the Kia uh, plant uh, tool, which by the way is absolutely fabulous, and they were saying, Okay, one hour, they're delayed for one hour in getting an important part. Whoa, what does it cost? They won't tell me the exact number, but it's very expensive. So they move a lot of their economic activity very close to their plant, as we know they did, uh, and very successfully. So we need to figure, figure out what the relationship is between that economic activity and, well, uh, and the amount of the number of trucks they generate. And, you know, we're, we're going near uh, getting, getting that information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just real quick, uh, we have a coffee break right now. Following the break, there will be two panel sessions. In this room, the ITE and WTS third chapters will be meeting. And in 236, there will be a state DOT panel. Thank you to all the presenters. Uh, they were really on time, I think, that morning. Uh, <laughs>